Thank you very much. That was wonderful. All right, good. All right, uh, this evening we're going to go through a little bit of review as we get into the Word of God. And But before we do, let's have another word of prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, Lord, it is a privilege for us to open up this ancient book. And we understand, Lord, that when somebody writes us a letter, perhaps when they're going off on a long, long journey and going to be gone for a long time, there's a lot of significance that is usually put into such a letter. And that's what you did in the book of Revelation. That before, or I should say at the time that you went back to heaven and the last prophet of the New Testament times, at least for us that was written in the Bible, you gave a very special message to him, to the Apostle John. And so, Lord, as we open up your word tonight once again and we seek to understand it, we're once again asking for your Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, what I'd like us to remember is uh, what we finished with last night. We're, we're going to do a little bit of a review. But remember, this is the particular verse that we ended with last night, Revelation 21, verse 5. And it says, Then he, God, who sat on the throne, said, Behold, I make all things new. Right, for these words are true and faithful. And you might remember that I, I, I asked the question, how do you know that the things that we're reading are true? In my particular experience, I had um, a lot of difficulty with finding people that were trustworthy in my life. And so I began to trust only myself. And I'll share a lot more of that later on in the series here. But I got to the point where I found that I couldn't even trust myself. And as you and I look out at the world today, we find that trust is a very uh, small commodity today. In other words, there are a lot of people saying, trust me, or saying, this is the truth, or this is what's right, or this is the, these are the facts. How many of you heard about the fact checkers, right? Especially in the political realm, it seems like there's a lot of sources out there that are trying to check the facts. And typically, if it's a Republican fact checker, they check them a certain way. And if it's a Democratic fact checker, they check them a certain way, right? And so a lot of times, if you try to do an objective look at these, you find out, well, you know, they're not quite as factual as they say they are on either side. And it seems like today it's getting less and less, it seems to be less and less capable of finding out who's really telling the truth about things. And in fact, uh, that's a big problem over in Russia right now because the Russian people are getting a certain truth presented to them, aren't they? And uh, then the Western countries as well. So, so when we come to the concept of what is truth, as Pilate asked Jesus that fateful moment before his crucifixion, we need to come to um, a conclusion about whether we can trust what's in this book. Because after all, friends, this book has been written by men that are human beings, just like us. And there's a lot of people that have, have written things that are not necessarily true. So how do you establish trust? How do you, how do you get to the point where you trust someone? How many of you would be willing to do this? Right? Sit there with uh, watermelon on your head, and the guy that's going to cut that watermelon in half or whatever is blindfolded. All right? Well, what about uh, William Tell? Do you remember the story of William Tell? Uh, you young people, how many of you would have been willing to allow somebody to put an apple on your head 
and then for your dad to shoot it off the top of your head. Yeah, evidently, from what I understand from the story, the father didn't want to do it, but the son, who was about 12 years old, said, Dad, I'm willing to do it. And so he said, I know that you can hit that apple. Now, sometimes people think that this is a myth. It actually did happen, and uh, he did use a crossbow. So uh, it's, it's this young man, and I can't remember his name, William Tell's son, had so much trust in his father that he was willing to put his life on the line for the um, accomplishment of what was, what was necessary at that time. So, so here's, the, here's the question that we need to answer. How do you have trust in something? And if you've lost trust, how do you get it back? Right? Anybody ever had somebody that you thought you trusted and then they did something and you lost your trust in them? There are people today, and maybe there's some of you that have lost trust in God. Now, I mentioned that I wasn't raised a Christian, but I heard all sorts of crazy stories about Christians and about God, and I had no trust in the Word of God. I had no trust in God. In fact, I didn't believe in God for many, many years. And so this was a big issue for me. You know, trust is so important that we even uh, put it on our money, don't we? We say what? In God we trust. Amen? So trust is a big issue, and, and we need to recognize that for some of us, for many of us, we need to come to the point where we do or can trust what the Bible says, as we're speaking about here. Because the Bible says some pretty amazing things. It says that if you believe in Jesus Christ, you can go to heaven somebody, someday. Now, um, it's just like somebody coming up to you and saying, hey, I'd like to sell you a bridge, and it's in Brooklyn, right? And so there's people that want to scam you. They, they say that they've got something for you, and they're basically saying, trust me. Well, how do you develop trust? And specifically when it comes to God, how do you develop trust in God? And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about tonight. Now, when we look at the book of Revelation uh, and trusting it, of course, because it's connected with the Bible, we need to find out is there, if there's a way that the Bible says that we can learn to trust God and the word of God. There are a lot of people, as I said last night, that say a lot of different things about the Bible. In fact, there's a couple of books out there. Maybe some of you have them. The Complete Idiot's Guide to the Book of Revelation. Uh, and then also the Book of Revelation for Dummies. Now, that sounds okay. In fact, I think way back when these books first started coming out, I bought a book that was called uh, the book, uh, let's see, uh, Windows for Dummies, I think is what it was. You know, it was talking about computers and learning how to run Windows. I think that's okay, and that book actually did help me. But I found myself scratching my head and wondering, do I really want to buy a book like this for the Bible? Is that really going to help me to learn to trust the God of the Bible? So there are lots of books out there that you can find. In fact, there's not only books, but one of the most renowned uh, organizations that we all know here in, in Western society, the National Geographic, a number of years back put out a, a series on the secrets of revelation. Now, wow, National Gra Geographic, you can trust them, can't you? Well, maybe you can trust them when it comes to animals, you know, talking about animals, zoology, and maybe archaeology and things like that, but I'd never come across them talking about the Bible before. And so I, I perused this, I, I watched this, uh, some of it, and here's what they say about it to begin with as they were advertising it. It called it the, a brutal blueprint of Judgment Day or a coded political manifesto. manifesto. So that was kind of how they described maybe what uh, the revelation was. National Geographic Channel unlocks the secrets of revelation. The effort to decode the symbols in the book of Revelation is the quest to find the ultimate answer to the ultimate human riddle. How does this story end? So as they began to share that, and I don't know that I saw the whole thing, but I saw enough of it to where I thought, mm, 
I'm not sure I'm really comfortable with the way that they're presenting this because they ask the question, is it truth or is it fiction? So right off the bat, they put a doubt in your mind whether this was the truth. Okay, But they also presented the Apostle John like he was a demented madman. Anybody see this particular uh, series? Yeah, it's quite fascinating. It's fairly old now. It's been a number of years back. But but the the kind of scenery, or not scenery, but the kind of graphics that they used in it made John look like he was kind of demented, like he was a little bit of a madman. And so immediately when a person starts to watch this, they're thinking, wow, this guy probably was kind of mad. He was probably like a Bobby Fischer. He was brilliant, you know, and as a chess person, but he was pretty crazy in a lot of other ways. And so that's the way they presented uh, John the Revelator. And so it didn't engender trust in me, at least. And I suspect that there were some others that didn't feel a lot of trust coming up there. So let's try to look at some of the facts about Revelation tonight. We're going to just kind of briefly go over some things and ask the Bible to tell us a little bit about itself. All right. So remember that we we looked last night and we found that the sanctuary has a lot to say or a lot to do in the book of Revelation, didn't we? And we found that there are things that it can tell us and help us in understanding that particular book. In fact, David, when he wrote Psalm 77, verse 13, he said, Thy way, O God, is in what? Is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Now, the Hebrew word for thy way or the way, your way means a mode of operation. So in other words, what David was saying is he understood that the sanctuary taught us how God is going to work in the, the span of humanity, of, of mankind. And we, we talked, in fact, about how it would be uh, revealing to us how God plans to save us. And we looked at that last night. And then in uh, Psalm 73, verse 3 and 4, David shares some of the conundrums that he was having. He says, for I envied the arrogant and saw the prosperity of the wicked. Now, David had a certain amount of time on his hands. And like maybe some of us, he looked out at the world and he began to realize, you know, here I am trying to follow God and I'm having all sorts of troubles. But I look at the people that don't believe in God or they believe in false gods and they're doing quite well. They're they're gaining money. They're gaining wealth. Uh, in some instances, some of these ki uh, kings were gaining kingdoms, right? And uh, they didn't have sicknesses and things like that. And so he began to ponder that. He wondered, what's the advantage of following God? Have you ever had those kind of thoughts? You look out at the world, and you know, the people that are evil, they're doing really good. You know, the, the particular leader of Russia right now, a lot of people are thinking this guy's not a good guy. And yet he seems to be prospering. He seems to be, 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 be doing pretty good. In fact, they're talking about how he might be one of the most wealthy men in the world. And so David began to see those things and he began to question. And so this is where the Psalm uh, 73 comes. For I envied the arrogant and I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to man. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. So he, he goes through this process, but then he ends this particular psalm by saying this in verse 17. Till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. So David, as he's pondering this, the Lord led him to think about what the sanctuary teaches. And he found out that, yes, they may prosper in this world, but the sanctuary teaches that they will be destroyed in the end. They will not be blessed. Remember how we talked about last night when the high priest comes out of the sanctuary, out of the most holy? He either has blessings or he has judgments. He has curses, right? And those who have accepted the Messiah, the, the, the sacrifice for their sins, are blessed. And they are, are, are taken to heaven. But those that are do not accept them and, and live in, in sin... They are lost and they are, they are destroyed. 
So we saw that. And we saw, of course, that, that Revelation talks about Jesus as our high priest ministering in the heavenly sanctuary as well. Now, once again, I uh, want to show you this particular I see that's off the side over there a little bit. I have to fix that. Um, we, we saw this overlay of the sanctuary and how Revelation 1 through 11 all takes place in the holy place. We saw that last night. And we also saw that Revelation 11, 19 through chapter 22 all takes place in the most holy place. So I hope you began to see last night as we began to open this up a little bit that the the book of Revelation is a lot, there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. It's not just a bunch of symbols and misunderstood um, uh, ancient history that that we can't understand or that we can't decipher. There's actually seems to be a very systematic process that is going on in how it was written. Do, do you remember seeing that last night? All right, so we're going to continue to look at this. We looked at this last night as well. We're going to look at this particular one tomorrow night in detail. So you don't want to miss that. So we found that that the um, the particular prophecies, this is the prophecy of the seven churches, that they actually take place in time period of, of a successive time periods. It's, starting at 27 AD, going all the way down to 1844 and on. It actually continues, but I just didn't have enough room for it there. But every single one of these prophecies uh, take place in the context of the holy place or the most holy place. Now, if you were to look up online in Wikipedia and uh, see what it says about the book of Revelation, it would say this. Although Revelation rarely quotes directly from the Old Testament, almost every verse, how many verses? Almost every verse alludes to or echoes older scriptures. In other words, the Old Testament. That was the, the, that was the Bible back in those days when Revelation was written. Over half of the references stem from Daniel. Now that's very key because what we're going to find out that the book of Daniel and Revelation are actually sister books. There's a lot of similar things. And one of you have said, talked about how you've seen some of those uh, different connections there. So over half of the references stem from, Dan stem from Daniel, Ezekiel, Psalms, and Isaiah, with Daniel providing the largest number in proportion to length and Ezekiel standing out as the most influential. So, when we, when we begin to examine uh, the book of Revelation, we find out that it is intertwined with the rest of the Bible, is what I'm saying. It's not written on its own. It's not out in left field, not something out of somebody's imagination, but it actually is very intimately connected with the rest of the Bible. In fact, another particular interesting tidbit about the book of Revelation is that there are parallels at the beginning of the book of Revelation and at the end of Revelation. I'm not going to go through all of these, but for instance, in chapter 1, verse 1, the phrase, what must soon take place, is written. But lo and behold, in chapter 22, verse 6, there's also that same phrase is there. So what you have is kind of like bookends. You have something similar at the beginning, have you have something similar at the end. So there's lots of different parallels. And what that's revealing to us is a very significant way that the book of Revelation is written. Now, what I'm doing here at this particular moment is I'm trying to share with you some of the details about Revelation that would help us to realize that this is not just some kind of... of um, a manifesto of a demented man, man, madman. It was written with a lot of precision and a lot of intelligence. So as we look at this particular uh, slide, we're looking at the layout of the book of Revelation. Now I'm going to describe it in just a second, but what I want to do at this point is ask you about poetry. How many of you like poetry? How many of you remember studying poetry in school? I don't know if they still do that today, but I was really fascinated by, by poetry. And they have lots of different kind of poetry, don't they? It's not just the, 
the um, um, roses are red, violets are blue kind of poetry. There are limericks, remember, there are ballads, there are lots of different types of poetry. And the Hebrew language had a lot of different kinds of poetic devices that they used. One of them was called a chiasm. And what that was is that the author would write something, a certain subject, for instance, or a theme at the beginning of his, his uh, chapter or his page, and then he would parallel it at the end, kind of like we rhyme things, you know? It's not a rhyme, really, but it's, it's a similar thought is what it is. That is the way the whole book of Revelation is laid out. It's rather complicated, actually. So, in other words, I don't know why that's going off the screen. It didn't last night. Hmm. Interesting. Would you be willing for me to stop and reboot this? Because sometimes it, it takes that to... Uh, or not reboot it, but anyway, just do this again. I'm going to have to go all the way back. <clears throat> all right, we'll jump forward here and see if we can get back to where we were. I think we're still off a little bit there. I'm not sure why. Okay, getting closer. Yeah, it's still off, so I'm not sure what that's all about. All right, well, I'll hopefully we can uh, make sense of it as we uh, move along here. All right, here we are. Okay, so for instance, in the first part of Revelation, uh, it talks about Christ walking among the seven golden lampstands in chapter two, verse one. At the very end, it talks about Christ as the lamp. So you see the similar theme there? At, um, then it, go, it talks about the tree of life in chapter two, verse seven. And then over here in chapter 22, at the very end, it talks about the tree of life. You see the parallelism there? And all through the book of Revelation, it does that. And these different sections that are color-coded parallel each other. Now, friends, I'm one of those guys that I can't juggle two balls at once. I'm amazed by these people that can flip, you know, four or five balls up in the air, whatever it is. It's pretty complicated, you know, pretty talented. But this is extremely complicated. This is not something that an ordinary man could do. In fact, I believe that it's divinely inspired because they didn't have erasers back in those days. In fact, they had parchment. How is John going to be able to say, now, I'm talking about the tree of life here at the beginning of my book, and then as I continue to write on my parchment, right, with no eraser, permanent ink, how am I going to remember to put that down at the very end? Right? And not only that, but all these other parallels that are existence all the way through the Bible. Friends, this is not something that humanity, a human being, can do. We can't juggle all those things at once. And so there has to be a divine uh, connection there. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about chiasms a little bit later and give you a, a smaller uh, picture of it. But what I want you to see here is not only is the whole book laid out that way, but individual chapters are like that. So, for instance, in chapter 2 and chapter 3, uh, it talks about the, uh, the church of Ephesus, that they've left their first love and uh, they will eat from the tree of life. At the very end, the last church it talks about is Laodicea, and it talks about love and that Jesus will eat with them. So those themes are similar. So even in the book itself, that it's itself a whole huge chiasm, there are individual chiasms here. And then even in chapter 2, in, in, within that one that I said, so it's like a chiasm within a chiasm, right? There is another one there. So it's just full of those kind of things there. Uh, in chapter 12 is another one where that's laid out that well. And I know that doesn't make sense to you right now, but we'll look at it in more detail a little bit later on. But right at the very center of the book of Revelation is the cross. Jesus is the theme of the book of Revelation. And it lifts up the importance of Jesus as our sacrifice and our Savior. 
So this is a book that has an astonishing lot of detail to it. And it's one of those things that you have to ask the question, was this written by a human or is this divine? Now, the Bible tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So the Bible itself tells us that what was written in there is not human, but it's divine that God moved upon the writers of the Bible, and so they wrote as they were moved upon by the Holy Spirit. That's what it says about itself. Now, here's the question, the big question. Can we trust what the Bible says about itself? Is it telling us the truth? Well, you know, in just showing you some of these things about Revelation, it sure seems more complicated than normal human beings can can figure out. So, um, let me give you an example. Uh, you know, they've been making flowers, plastic flowers, that are getting so close to to looking like they're real, right? I mean, sometimes we, we buy those and you can get, um, well, I think this is a plastic plant, right? It looks pretty real. They make them to where they look pretty real. And, of course, then we've got the real one on the uh, right side here. But how do you know which one is really real? The closer you look, the more you can see whether it's real or whether it's not real. In fact, if you were to take a magnifying glass to the, the uh, store-bought flower, it would start getting more and more ugly the closer you got, right? But if you did that with a real flower, what would you find? you would find it would get more and more beautiful the closer you look. In fact, as scientists take their microscopes and look at flowers and things like that, they're astonished by the intricate detail, the design that's in it the closer they look, right? So that's what we're looking at with the book of Revelation and specifically, well, the Bible, but specifically the book of Revelation. All right, so uh, another factor that we're going to, Add on to what Wikipedia said earlier, of the 404 verses in Revelation, 278 contain material from the Old Testament. In fact, the book of, Reve uh, the book of Daniel has many parallels to Revelation, ranging from the subjects of the end time, uh, the beast that, we, that we'll, we'll see there in both places, the Antichrist. It talks about the Antichrist. It talks about the judgment. We saw a little bit of that last night. It talks about the succession of nations from one to another and also talks about war against the church. Also, it goes on to talk about a series of prophecies that end in the second coming of the Messiah. We'll start to look at that tomorrow night in the... the, the um, the prophecy about the seven churches. In fact, Jesus encourages us to understand the book of Daniel. Did you know that? Yeah, when Jesus talked, one of the things he, he mentioned is the book of Daniel. He says that, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let him who flees, it goes on. But he says, whoever reads, let him what? understand. So Jesus tells us that when you see these things, you need to be reading the book of Daniel because it's going to help you to understand these end time scenarios. So if Jesus was, was uplifting the book of Daniel to read, it sounds like it's pretty legit. All right, we saw this the other night, Revelation 1, 18 and 19 says, I am the living one, Jesus is speaking here, I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what it will take place later. Now, that's a phrase that it's using there, but what is that referring to, what will take place later? What is, what is that referring to? It's, it's referring to the future, but it's referring to what the Bible calls prophecy, right? Prophecy is something about the future. So that's going to be one of the keys that's going to help us to learn whether we can trust the Bible or not. In fact, Jesus said in John 13, 19, Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you might believe that I am he. So God gave us prophecy 
to find out whether he's trustworthy or not. Do you see that? Because if he can predict the future and it's accurate, then he ought to be someone we can trust. Does that make sense to you? Sure. All right, so I'd like you to turn in your Bibles now to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 2, and we're going to look at just one prophecy. There are hundreds of prophecies in the Bible, but and all of them do the same sort of thing. They help us to learn that God is trustworthy. But we're going to look at Daniel chapter 2 this evening. Now, what page is that in your seminar Bibles? 1,018 in your seminar Bibles. Thank you, Joseph. 1,018. All right. So Daniel 2 is going to talk to us about a dream that the king Nebuchadnezzar had. And we're going to see that that God is going to be proved trustworthy through this prophecy. In fact, this is one of the major prophecies that helped me to come to trust God and trust the Bible. All right, so let's take a look at it, chapter one or chapter two, and we're going to begin with verse one. Now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his spirit that his sleep left him. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, to tell the king his dreams. So that they came, so they came and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I have had a dream and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will give you the interpretation. Sounds like a reasonable request, right? Verse five. But the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision is firm. The King James says, the thing is gone from me. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made an ash heap. Now that's quite a response, right? (laughs) If you can't tell me the dream, I'm going to chop off your heads, basically, and I'm going to destroy you and your family. Now, why was the king so anxious to know this dream? Well, what we find out from studying the the religion of King Nebuchadnezzar is that they believe that the gods talk to them through dreams. And so if you believe your God is talking to you through your dream and you can't remember the dream, are you going to be kind of anxious to know what's, what that was? Yeah, so that's why he's so excited about this. That's why he's so upset. Plus, kings back in those days were despots and they did stuff like this. They just chopped people's heads off. But it goes on in verse 6, however, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. They answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will give you its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know for a certain that you would gain time because you see that my decision or the thing is gone for me, that my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, There is only one decree for you. So he goes on to say that you are going to be destroyed. Then in verse 10, the Chaldeans answered the king and said, there is not a man on earth who can tell the king's manner. I can't tell you what you dreamed. If you're not going to tell me, I can't get into your head. But these magicians, these particular counselors, claim to have that kind of insight. And so they're just saying right here that there is no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or a Chaldean. It is a difficult king thing, verse 11, that the king requires. And there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. So the Chaldeans basically tell him, we can't tell you what you want. Only God can tell you that. And the king was furious. So he commanded that all the wise men, all the wise men in Babylon should be killed. Not just the ones there that he was talking to, but he was so furious that he just decided, I'm going to wipe you all out. So he issued that decree and the decree went out. Now, what was, uh, what was the problem with that was that Daniel and his three friends were also 
some of the wise men by then. Now, they weren't into the magic and all that sort of thing, the sorcery, but they were there as captives of the, of the, of the tri, or the, um, country of Israel. And so they were going to be killed too. And so then, in verse 14, it says, Then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. And he answered and said to him, Why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king, verse 16, to give him time, that he might tell the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to the ho- to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek the mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret. So what did Daniel and his friends do? They prayed. Amen? You see, friends, the Bible gives us ideas or, or concepts of how we ought to respond when, we're fo- when we find ourselves in difficult situations. Amen? That when, when we're faced with things that we can't figure out that are out of our control, we need to pray. We need to ask God for uh, his answer and his help. Amen? So that's exactly what Daniel and his friends did. And then during that time of prayer, God gave the answer to Daniel. And in verse 20, he says this. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his And he changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers, that you have given me wisdom and might and have made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's demand. So God opened Daniel's eyes. He gave him the dream that he had given to Nebuchadnezzar. And so he goes back to King Nebuchadnezzar and he tells him, he begins to tell the interpretation of it. Now in verse 28, it goes on and uh, he's now before King Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel answers him and he says in verse 28, But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dreams and the visions upon your head, uh, upon your bed, were these. And so Daniel begins the process of sharing with him the dream that God had given to him and also the interpretation. Now, let me pause for just a second and ask you the question. Why are we going into Daniel 2 with this particular dream? What's the theme that we're talking about today, tonight? We're talking about how can we trust God, right? We're talking about the book of Revelation, and it says certain things. We looked at that last night. It promises salvation to those who accept Jesus, things of that nature. And we asked the question, but there's a lot of people promise us many things. How do we know if we can trust God, right? And tonight we've seen that Jesus said, I tell you beforehand that when it comes to pass, you might believe. Or we could say you might trust. Amen? Now, if I was going to tell you your future for the next 24 hours, and it all came to pass exactly as I said, what would you think of Pastor Stewart after that? Think, wow, he's kind of trust, he's pretty trustworthy, right? I wonder if he goes to Las Vegas. <laughs> no, he doesn't. <laughs> but the more uh, the things that I might predict that would come true in your life, you begin to think, oh, he's pretty trustworthy. He's pretty accurate, right? It would increase your faith in me and your trust in me, wouldn't it? And that's exactly what God does with prophecy. That as we see that prophecy has come true, It increases our trust in this God that we cannot see, that has said that he has written the Bible for our benefit. All right, let's continue and see what we can do with that. All right, so Daniel Daniel 2 verse 28 says uh, that Daniel will be telling him the dream, but he says specifically what will be in the latter days. So 
what we're what God is about to reveal to us is the march of history, the rise and fall of empires, but he places the emphasis on what's going to happen in the latter days. In other words, what he's saying is what's most important about this interpretation that I'm going to give you is what happens at the end. Okay, that's what he's saying. So we're going to see that, how important that is as we go through this. All right, let's continue. He says in verse 20, uh, 31, we're going to continue on the screen now, uh, and you can read this at your leisure at another time, but we're going to uh, show the interpretation of this as Daniel goes through it. So he says in verse 31, You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. He saw this incredibly huge image. So Daniel, and, and I imagine King Nebuchadnezzar was sitting on the edge of his throne by now, because as Daniel begins to relate it, it become, his memory comes back. You ever got up in the morning and you had a significant dream, impressive dream, but you couldn't remember it? And then maybe you were sitting down to breakfast and all of a sudden something came into your mind. Oh, I remember now. It's coming back to me. You ever had that? Well, that's evidently what was happening to King Nebuchadnezzar. As Daniel began to relate the dream, Nebuchadnezzar was probably saying, yeah, that's exactly what I saw. He saw this great image and then the stone that was cut without hands that was going to smite it. So, so he sees this image and he's, he's, he's remembering that this is exactly what he saw as he, as he was on his bed. All right. Uh, we missed something there. So let's go back to the Bible now and verse 29, uh, through 35, uh, verse 30. No, let's, let's go to 31. Sorry. <laughs> But you, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image, this great image whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces." that the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer fleshing, threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great what? A great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Now we will tell you the interpretation of it. Now, it says here that this stone that struck the image became a great mountain. Now, some of you have probably uh, realized as you've read through Daniel or Revelation, there's a lot of symbols in there. Uh, this stone became a great mountain. What does that mean? Well, in interpreting these symbols, we must let the Bible interpret it itself. Because if you take it from outside the Bible, how many different interpretations may you get? as many as there are people on this planet, right? So what we need to do is let God interpret it for us. So we should look, for instance, in this case about what's a mountain represent, we should look in the Bible and see what does the Bible say a mountain represents. And that's where we go to Jeremiah 51, verse 24 and 25. God is talking about Babylon here. He says, I will repay Babylon and all the inhabitants of Chaldea for all the evil that they have done. And watch this. Speaking to Babylon, he says, Behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain, who destroys all the earth, says the Lord. What does God call Babylon? He calls it a destroying mountain. So a mountain can re represent a nation or a kingdom. Now, this is not the only place where you find that. There's a lot of other places where God refers to a mountain as Israel. Ever heard of the, the term Mount Zion? What does that represent? It represents Israel. It's the same thing, see? So a mountain represents a kingdom. Here God calls Babylon a destroying mountain. So when this stone strikes the, the image and then it becomes a great mountain and fills the whole earth, it's talking about a kingdom that ends up taking over the entire earth in, these, in the last days. We'll, we'll take a look at that at the very end of the, of the prophecy here. All right, let's continue. Verse 37, 38, you, O king, are a king of kings. You are this head of gold. 
So Daniel tells him that the head of gold represents who? Represents him or represents the kingdom of Babylon. Now, what do we know about Babylon? Well, if you look in ancient uh, or in uh, history books about Babylon, it was an incredibly huge and very wealthy uh, empire. Babylon was about t 10 miles around in size. Now, that's not very big con con comparing with our cities today, but in those days, it was huge. For instance, in comparing it with Rome, Rome was only six miles around. And Athens, these were great cities. Athens was only four miles around. But Babylon was 10 miles around, almost twice as big as them. So it was huge. Babylon was known for the hanging gardens of, of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the world. It also had the temple of Marduk that was 300 feet high, and outside it was covered with blue glazed tile, and inside the temple it was overlaid with gold. Now you remember, what was the, what was the metal of the head? It was gold. That's very significant, because watch this. Battle, the temple of Marduk contained 18 pounds of gold. Oh, did I say that wrong? 18 tons. Can you imagine 18 tons of gold? This is incredible. 18 tons of gold, eight and a half tons in the altar and the throne alone. So there was incredible amount of gold there. In fact, when, when, um, Alexander the Great came hundreds and hundreds of years later after Babylon had been destroyed. He still found enough gold in the ruins to be able to pay his army. I mean, that's how much gold was still left over that they hadn't pilfered. Babylon had a 20-year food supply that they had stored up there. It was called the head of gold. It ruled from 605 to 539 B.C., so that's the head of gold that started the, the um, timeline that God is laying out here for us. But then Daniel goes on and he says in verse 39, <coughs> excuse me, verse 39, but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. So that would be the chest, what, of silver, amen? That would be of silver. So Persia, the Medo-Persians came on the scene and they conquered Babylon in 539 BC and, and uh, existed until 331 BC. They were the chest and arms of silver. Now it's interesting that the, the Medes and the Persians, they eventually became only the Persians. The Persians kind of took over the Medes. But it was interesting that they were not interested in plunder. They weren't interested in money and gold, you know, and silver and all. So their, even though they weren't interested in it, they did not use their currency, the currency of gold. They used silver as their currency. So it really fits with the, the prophecy. We know this from, from the, the history books. In Isaiah 13, verse 17, God predicted that this would happen hundreds of years before it ever happened. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them, which shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. That's just referring to they weren't into the plunder. They just wanted empire. They wanted to conquer. And so God, some 150 years before the Medes and the Persians came on the scene, and even Babylon predicted that the Medes and the Persians would conquer Babylon. So it's incredible when you look at this historically. You know, I when I first read this, I went down to the library and I got out a secular history book and I read exactly what the Bible says. And I remember from my time in school, you know, studying about ancient history here. This is exactly what happened. So God is incredibly accurate here. And we remember the story about the handwriting on the wall. You remember that? That was the time when God numbered the days of Babylon and uh, said that your kingdom is divided to the Medes and the Persians. Now, what's fascinating about that is the details that God puts into the Bible that tells us how Babylon would be conquered. Remember I told you that Babylon had a 20-year uh, store of food in the city? Usually what conquering nations would do is they try to lay siege to a city and basically starve them out. 
Well, if you've got 20 years food supply and your water is running through the middle of your city in the form of the Euphrates River, are you going to give in very quickly? No. They thought they were unconquerable. But God predicted something that was going to happen. He predicted that that Cyrus the Great, the general of the Medes and the Persians, he would he would stop the flow of the Euphrates River. Is exactly what he did. You can read this in the in the history books. And he marched his troops underneath the the the, the wall into the city while all the Babylonians were having a, a drunken orgy. Now, here's here's an incredible detail. God named Cyrus approximately 150 years before he was born. And he told in the prophecy that he's the one that would conquer Babylon. Here it is in Isaiah 45, verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. Now this detail here is fascinating because what it's saying is that these there were there were these leaved gates that were across the Euphrates River so that uh, the enemy could not go underneath the Euphrates, you know, swim underneath. So there were like a an iron gate underneath there, and they were supposed to be locked. But on that night where King Belshazzar was having a drunken uh, celebration and flaunting itself as they were being surrounded by the Medo-Persian army, somebody left the gates open. And God predicted that this would happen. What does he say here? He says that he will open before him the double door so that the gates will not be shut. And, and Cyrus saw that and he diverted the water enough to where his men were able to march in underneath the walls of Babylon through the, the dry riverbed and they were able to conquer Babylon exactly had, as God had predicted. Now, what is the probability of somebody being able to predict the name of the general who would conquer Babylon 150 years beforehand? What are the odds of that? I mean, yeah, it's not possible, humanly speaking, right? That's an incredible detail that the Bible gives us here in this prophecy. It goes on in verse 39. Then after this other kingdom overcomes Babylon, he says, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. Again, you go down to your library, you, you check out a secular textbook, and it will tell you that the next kingdom that conquered the Persian Empire was the kingdom of Greece, right? And we know that Alexander the Great was the was the king of that uh, empire, wasn't he? Now, here's a fascinating uh, story about that. When when uh, Alexander the Great crossed the Hellenspout from Greece into Asia Minor, he came across with 40,000 men in his army. Guess how many men the Persians uh, put on the field? A million. So it was 40,000 men against a million. Now, if you were a betting person, which one would you think would win? The million. It's a no-brainer, right? But what did the prophecy say? That another kingdom of bronze would overcome the silver kingdom, right, of Persia. And that's exactly what happened. Why choose bronze? The, the, The Greeks were known for their bronze armor. Their bronze shields, their bronze swords, everything about them is called the Bronze Age, you know, in, in the in the textbooks and all. And we know that that Alexander trounced the the Persians on the in the Battle of Arabella in 331 uh, BC. And Greece lasted from 331 to 168 BC as the thighs of brass. So we're we're coming down the statue, but we're also going through history here, aren't we? Daniel continues in verse 40. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. Any of you remember your history? What was the next conquering empire to overcome the Greeks? It was Rome. Again, go down to the library. You can read that. This was written in six, about somewhere around 600 B.C., before Christ, 
this prophecy. And yet, incredibly accurately, it predicts exactly what would happen in the future. Rome would come on the scene. In fact, uh, Rome would last from 168 BC to 476 AD. Huge amount of time that the legs of iron in the Roman Empire lasted. And they just were a brutal people. They conquered. They, they used iron swords for the first time. Iron was one of their major uses. In the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, Edwin Gibbon, Edward Gibbon says, the images of gold, silver, or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. And, and Edward Gibbons was not a, uh, a believing man. He was not a Christian. He was not a God-fearing man. But he understood that Rome was pictured here in the prophecy. In verse 41, Daniel continues, Just as you saw that the feet and the toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Now, if this was written afterwards, you would think, or by anybody, you would think, well, after Rome conquered, then there would be another kingdom that would conquer, right? Because that's the pattern. But that's not what Daniel says. He says that it would be a divided kingdom. And sure enough, as you look at the fall of Rome, it was not conquered by one kingdom. It was destroyed partly from within, but also there were 10 Germanic tribes that came down from the north and they began to take apart the Roman Empire. Some of those, those um, tribes were the Anglo-Saxons, the Franks, the Alemanni, Burgundians, Suevi, Visigoths, the Vandals, the Lombards, the Ostrogoths, the Heruli, Ten different tribes, they began to take apart the Roman Empire. And they became eventually the nations of Europe. Now the Anglo-Saxons became the, the, uh, the English, the Franks became the French, the Alemanni became the Germans, etc., Heruli, uh, Ostrogoths, and on and on. So this is what happened. And as they continued to moved through history, those Germanic tribes began to break apart into their own different um, countries, as it were, and they fought with each other because everybody wanted to go back to the glory of the old Roman Empire, but they never succeeded in doing it. And so the Bible says that they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. Now, this is a fascinating detail that sometimes people don't pick up when they read through this. Now, what it's telling us here, it says they will mingle with the seed of men. What does that mean? And I looked at that and I thought, what is, what is, the, what is the Bible talking about? Well, what I realized it's talking about, it's a euphemism for um, uh, having children in marriage, sexual you know, relations in, in marriage, okay? And so the Bible is saying they will mingle with the seed of men. And then it dawned on me how they tried to make peace with themselves in Europe. You remember your history of how sometimes France would be at war with England? And sometimes France would be at war with Spain or with Germany and, you know, all those sort of things. Do you know how they tried to make peace? One king would marry off his son or his daughter to another king. And then they would make peace for a while, right? And that's the way they did it. This is a fascinating little little uh, detail in the prophecy written somewhere around 600 BC. How did anybody know? How could mankind know that? How did God know that? Because he knows the future, right? Because he's trustworthy. And so he predicted that this would happen, but it, it never really, uh, uh, it stuck. They never really made fr peace. Now there's a, there's a castle in Denmark called the Frederiksborg Castle. And in there they have a family tree of all the nations of Israel, or of, uh, of Europe. And it shows how they're interrelated because of all this intermarrying that took place. It's a fascinating picture and proof that the Bible knew what it was talking about. They will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another. And friends, the story of Europe has been somebody coming up in the picture, the scheme of time, and trying to reunite Europe because for the glory days of, of old, old Rome. There was Charlemagne 
the Frank king, he tried to do it. And then there was Charles V that tried to unite all of Europe, and he wasn't successful. And then, of course, there was Napoleon. You remember Napoleon. This is what he said in his journal. There will be one Europe, there will be one currency, there will be one language, there will be one government over all of Europe. He was defying God because he knew about the prophecy. Somebody had told him about the prophecy that they will not cling. But guess what happened after the Battle of Waterloo? He said, God Almighty is too much for me. He realized that when he failed, that the prophecy was still true, that they would not cling to one another. And then, of course, we have uh, Hitler as the one that was the, the latest one, right? And he said, one people, one empire, one leader. Did he succeed? No. Why? Because the prophecy said they shall not cling to one another. They shall be partly weak and partly strong. And that's the characteristic of all the nations of, of um, Europe. They will mingle with the singing of men, but they will not adhere one to the other. So now, where are we at in the stream of time? Friends, we have come down to present reality. Because we are in the toes of the statue. Because we progress from Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, divided Rome, and now we're in the toes. That's where we are in history. That's what the Bible is telling us. That's what the prophecy is telling us. We're in that time where they will not adhere. They'll try, but they won't adhere, but it won't happen. So we've got this uh, prophecy that God has given us that is incredible. So we're talking about trust here tonight. And we're looking at a prophecy that God has given us to help us learn to trust him. Amen? Because he's told, told the future with unerring accuracy of what's going to happen. You see, let, let's, lay, let's lay this out really clearly here. So what we've got is Babylon that God predicted would come on the scene. And by the way, this wasn't just in, ba in Daniel's prophecy, but also earlier in in the book of, of uh, Isaiah that he predicted that Bam Babylon would take over, over the, the Israelite nation. God is 100% accurate in predicting that, isn't he? Amen? What about Medo-Persia? What is his accuracy there? Did he predict that right on the, on the button? Sure he did. He's 100% accurate there. Then he predicted that uh, the Bronze Empire would come up. Did Greece come up? At exactly the right time, he was 100% accurate, amen? And then after that, he said the iron would come up, iron monarchy of Rome. That was the one that came up after the bronze one. Was he accurate there? Yeah, 100% accuracy. And then he said not another kingdom, but it would be a divided Rome. That's exactly what Europe is today. It's, it's divided nations, and they will not adhere to one another. Was he accurate there? Friends, look at this slide because we're talking about having trust in the person or the entity that has given us this prophecy. If somebody is 100% accurate in the things that they predict, what should that do to our trust level? We sh it should be sky high. We should recognize that this person or this entity is trustworthy. Amen? That's exactly what God predicted should happen when he gave uh, prophecy. And, and here's the rest of the, the timeline because we have Rome and then we have divided Rome, but then we're going on from there and Nebuchadnezzar is, is looking, is, he's, he's, he's listening to this prophecy and he's, he's, that he's had when he was, was laying down and, and asleep and he's, in, he's incredulous that Daniel has laid this all out before him. He's seen, but, but he's also seen that there is a stone that is cut without hands at the very end of the prophecy. Remember that? And remember how Daniel said that God would show you what will be in the latter days? So he's really, the emphasis on the prophecy is really in the latter days. Now, yes, we are in the ten toes. We're down here at the end of time. This is how we know that it's almost time for the Lord to come. Because what does the rock represent? When you look at the Bible and you, you talk about a stone or a rock, who typically is associated with that rock? 
Jesus is, God is, right? So what the prophecy is telling us is that this stone that was cut without hands, in other words, it's not human origin, it comes from heaven, it's going to destroy all these nations, and then what's it going to do? It's going to become a great mountain and fill the whole earth. It's talking about the second coming, right? It's talking about Jesus coming in the clouds of glory. Friends, this is what the prophecy emphasizes. It's not so much the rise and fall of nations, but it's the fact that one day God is going to come and he's going to set everything right. He's going to set the captives free. He's going to save his people. He's going to set up his kingdom in the last days and it will rule the entire earth. Now, we have to ask the question, uh, when you look at this, Every every indication, or every, I should say, every particular instance of this prophecy is 100% correct. Is that right? But the kingdom of God has not been set up yet, has it? So we can't say it's 100% yet. But what are the odds? What are the odds that if every single other part of this prophecy is 100% accurate, what are the odds that this second coming of Christ is going to happen? I mean, if you're a betting man or a betting woman, you're going to say 100%, right? That's how we know that that God can be trusted, that the next thing to come in our lifetime is the second coming of Christ. Amen. Daniel 2, 44, 45 said, For as much as you saw the stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God has made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is what? It's certain, and the interpretation thereof is what? is sure you can take this to the bank, friends. You can know that God is trustworthy. He gives us prophecy to prove that he's trustworthy, that we can we can anchor ourselves upon him, that when he says to you that I want you to give your hearts to me, I want to save you from your sins, I want to take you to home to, home to heaven, that when it says that in the Bible, that he's trustworthy, that we don't have to fear. Because he's given us prophecy. And this is only one prophecy. We're going to see many, many others that show that the God of heaven is trustworthy. When John was on Patmos and he was getting these, these, these visions and dreams from God, he showed him the trustworthiness of God. Revelation 22, 6 and 7 says, And he said to me, These sayings are faithful and what? Faithful and true. And tonight we've seen how we can trust what God has written in the book of Revelation. Because the prophecies that he gives in the rest of the book, including Revelation, we'll look at some of those, are faithful and true, 100% accurate. How many of you would like to, to trust a God like that? Incredible. Amen. Me too. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we close our series tonight, we want to thank you that you know that we have doubts sometimes. We grow up in a world where people say, trust me all the time, and we get fooled and we get taken. And you knew that we would have those problems. And so you gave us prophecy to help show us that you are trustworthy, that you know the end from the beginning. And if you can predict the rise and fall of empires, certainly you can deal with the living of our lives and our particular time on this earth. Oh, Lord, help us to surrender to you and trust you in the things that have to do with our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we close tonight, I want to remind you there will be some handouts that uh, we'll give you this evening, and you can take a look at those, and there'll be a little bit of a review on, on this. Tomorrow night, we're going to look at the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3. So I invite you to do a little homework tonight. If you haven't read it for a while, go home and read Daniel, or excuse me, Revelation 2 and 3. We're going to look at the prophecy of the seven churches. God bless you, and we'll see you tomorrow night at 7.